Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, braving the elements. Boy, it's raining, and the last few weeks it's been raining here more than, than, uh, than it has in a few months. So thanks for braving the elements. Someday, 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 I'm going to forgive. You ever had that thought in your mind? You go, I want to forgive, but I'll forgive someday. I'm not sure when, because it really hurt. I'm not sure how, because it did set me back significantly. And I'm not even sure why. I didn't do anything. They're the one that did it. There's so many things that can hurt us so deeply that we sometimes put off forgiving. In fact, sometimes we even just refuse to extend forgiveness ever at all. And in the video, you saw some of the big ones that we may have experienced ourselves that cause us to fight against forgiveness. Now, when we put off forgiving, it can alter the way we live. It can start dictating to us how we live. Unforgiveness can. We, 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 we won't go to a wedding because that person will be there, and we avoid celebrating something great because of somebody else. Or we, don't, or we get really angry at the mention of somebody's name or the mention of an event, just the mention of it, and we get angry, and it triggers bitterness. Or we decide we're never going to speak to certain people again. I'm never going to speak to them again. Or if I could turn the tables, maybe we've sinned so significantly in our life, really blown it, really messed up so significantly in our life that we even struggle to forgive ourselves, to let ourselves kind of off the hook. I'm confident in saying this, especially after hearing the feedback from people in the first service. We have all wrestled with forgiveness and unforgiveness with others. And so what I want to do is I want to continue our someday series by focusing on another topic that we sometimes put off till someday when we need to deal with it today, and that's this. Someday I'll forgive and let go. So take out your notes and open to Matthew chapter 18. The big idea in this series is this. We have to stop waiting for life to happen to us, and we have to start happening to it. The passive life is not the life worth living. You want to live an active life, a meaningful life, where you're taking on life, seizing it, challenging it. Rather than being reactive, you're proactive toward it. And forgiveness is one of those areas of life in which we tend to be uh, reactive and someday-ish, if you will. I believe that because it's the way it's been mishandled so many times I see it because I see relationships destroyed, I see hearts hardened, I see souls tormented by it, and I see people as the walking wounded because of how they engage it. I also believe that part of the reason is that forgiveness is very, very, very misunderstood. I think most people don't fully get everything that forgiveness is and isn't. As a result, we live in unforgiveness sometimes in part for the silliest of reasons. So what I want to do is I want to answer four key questions about forgiveness. And I want to use two passages. I want to use a parable Jesus told in Matthew chapter 18 to answer these four questions. And then I want to jump in the middle of our looking at the parable. I want to look at Romans chapter 12 and give us four practical applications in the middle of it. So let's jump right in. Here's the first question. What is forgiveness? Now you would think that people know the answer, but many only have part of it down and not all of it. So I want to answer this question, what is forgiveness? And I want to do so by introducing a parable. Now we're going to look at a parable in Matthew chapter 18. Before the parable, the disciples had just been told by Jesus what to do when a fellow believer sins against them. Like what they should do. And I'm not I'm going to cover that. You can read it on your own. So they just come off what they should do when somebody does something wrong to you, a fellow believer. And um, this triggered a question from one of the disciples. And guess who it was? Peter, of course. And Peter asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Now, this is a fascinating answer because the religious leaders of Israel oftentimes uh, um, deleteriously, negatively, they would help God out. Whenever God would make a law, they would help God out by trying to add specificity to God's laws. That's what religious leaders did. 
Now, tradition in a church is fine, but human tradition is never fine. Human tradition always tends to compete with the Bible, and then people tend to elevate human tradition over the Bible. So there's, there's a lot of damage in human tradition, and here's one of them. Because the religious leaders of the day, the Bible says you should forgive people, but the religious leaders of the day will say, well, that can't be an unlimited thing. You can't keep doing that, they surmise. So they said, they made up a rule. It's man-made human tradition rule, and they said this, you only have to forgive people three times. Now, isn't that silly? It's pretty silly. Now, think about Peter's answer. Should we forgive up to seven? I mean, he doubles it and adds one for good measure. He probably throws out the number seven because the number seven is the number of completion in the Bible. So Peter figures, well, let's see, if there's got to be a number to it, of course, having trouble sorting out human tradition from God's commandment, he says, oh, let's make it seven, the number of completion. Then if we do that, then we've completely forgiven them. And time number eight, they're done. They're dead to me. <laughs> no, Jesus replied, 70 times seven. Put away your calculators. Put, <laughs> put them away. Jesus is not saying you have to forgive 490 times. Because I can see some of you. I forgive you. 287. <laughs> right? You can't wait for 491. Then you can lay into them. No, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> Think about what he's saying. If seven is the number of completion, Peter had a lot of faith to say seven. Jesus says 70 times seven. Seven, the number of completion, multiplied by another number of completion, up by a factor of 10, and then multiplied. What is he saying? Complete, complete, complete completeness is what you must forgive. So he's not literally saying 490 times. And I don't think you even thought that. What is he fundamentally saying? As often as you have to. Unconditionally, no strings attached. This shouldn't surprise anybody. Because from the third chapter of the Bible to the very end, the message of this book, which we entrust everything we do to. It's the basis for all we do. The message from, doesn't happen in the first two chapters because it was unneeded. From the third chapter of the Bible all the way to the end, the nearly 1,200 chapters of the Bible, the message recurring through the Bible is one of rescue and redemption. In fact, the message of the Bible is basically this. People have fallen and God is going to get on a redemptive mission to rescue people and someday manifest the full expression of his grace through his kingdom, which is what we're studying at Common Ground on Thursdays, first and third Thursday of each month. The message of forgiveness, it's impossible. It's not like the message of forgiveness is brought up occasionally, like certain topics and themes. No. The message of forgiveness is, the, the, is like the spine of the Bible. It's ultimately why Jesus Christ died. So after he tells them this, he illustrates it with a parable. Remember, a parable is an alongside story. A parable literally means to cast alongside. A parable is a story about something familiar to help you understand another thing which is less familiar. So he's going to tell a familiar story to help understand the less familiar concept of forgiveness, which tells us what? Forgiveness isn't always completely understood by people. So he begins, and he says, the kingdom of heaven, let's stop right there. I find it interesting that when he's going to talk about forgiveness, he brings in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because to get in the kingdom of heaven, you have to be forgiven by God through Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're getting in. Not by being good or moralism or all the, the, the myths and misconceptions that people all over town will say. You know, you've got to be a good person. Well, you've got to be a good person. problem is you can't. You can't. So you need forgiveness. So that's why I think he brings it in. But he says, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king, which I think represents God, who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants, which represents people, who had borrowed money from him. And I think the borrowed money represents, in this story, moral debt. He uses financial debt to talk about the moral debt, the moral debt we have because of our sin and all this. So that's where I think um, those three characters, the king, the servants, and the money represent. And you'll see that very clearly, I think, in the parable. He says, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. That's why I chose the New Living Translation. Millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so the king ordered that he, his wife, 
his children, and every single thing that he had be sold to pay the debt. But watch this. But the man fell down before the king and begged him, Oh, sir, be patient with me, and I will pay it all. The truth is he had plenty of time to pay it all, but he hadn't. Then the king was filled with what? Pity. Circle that. Pity. And he released him and forgave his debt. Now I want you to circle not only pity, I want you to circle. This is important. Trust me. Released, forgave. Released and forgave. Circle those words. Now notice a few things in the parable. Number one, the king could have rightly imprisoned the debtor. He had every right to do it, and it wouldn't have been wrong. Number two, he was rightfully owed the money. Nothing in the parable suggests that that he wasn't really due the money. But third, and this is key, but the king did not because he was moved by what? Pity. Why is that? Because the king understood forgiveness. He understood what forgiveness is, understood what forgiveness isn't. So what is forgiveness? Could you give me a definition? I think this verse tells us what forgiveness is. So let me give you a working definition. Forgiveness is releasing someone from an obligation to pay you back for a wrong they've committed. It's releasing someone from an obligation to pay you back for a wrong they've committed. It's saying, I release you from having to pay me back. It's saying, I will not base my happiness on my expectations of you. It's saying, I know you owe me. This is good. I know you owe me, but I refuse to owe you. And it's not saying... I forgive and forget. Do you ever hear that? It sounds so beautiful. Forgive and forget. It's, it, they even, it's alliterative. It's awesome. It's got, they both begin with F. It's a preacher's dream. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's only one problem with forgive and forget. Actually, three. Number one, it's impossible. Number two, it's unwise. Number three, it's abjectly unbiblical to forgive and forget. It's impossible to forget something. It's literally impossible. It is unwise and it is unbiblical. Now I realize God says, and we're going to hear this later in a great story as we close about Corey Ten Boom. I, I realize that God says, uh, I will remember your sins no more. Do you ever hear that one? So if people say, well, God doesn't remember them. Who are you better than God? God remembers them. If God didn't remember ontologically that this transaction occurred, he wouldn't be omniscient. He wouldn't be all-knowing. So it's got to mean something different. When God says, I will remember them no more, God means I will remember them in the sense that there will be no consequence for this. In that sense, he doesn't remember. But if you say God totally forgets, then he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. That, that's silly. You, you, it's, it's bad theology. So what he's saying is, I will remember your sins no more. There will be no consequence for this. That's grace. The text teaches us that God calls us to not forgive and forget, but to forgive and release. Did you see those words I had you circle? Forgive and release. That's biblical. Let me tell you why forgive and forget's not biblical. Let's just say, um, some time ago, somebody broke into your house. Broke into your house and stole a whole bunch of things of precious value, uh, sold them at a pawn shop, and they're gone forever. They get arrested and everything else, and then they come to you and they say, look it, I'm a Christian. Will you forgive me? Would you? Well, whether you would or not, I don't know. But I would hope you would. But would you forget? So if they said, hey, I heard you're going on a date with your wife. Could I house sit for you Saturday? Would you do it? Oh, you, you didn't forget. Because you shouldn't forget. How about if we had, and listen, our doors are open even to these people, but how about if we had somebody who molested a child? 
By the way, we get all the records. We get all of that, and our security team is on it. We have a notebook. And we have somebody that did that. So are we to say you never come to church? No, their door, our doors are open to that. But what if somebody did that and say, look, I, I'm a Christian, I, I, and I ask God for forgiveness. Could I work in the children's ministry? I mean, would, would you, if you were the senior, would, no, you wouldn't. You didn't forget. Right, because I shouldn't. But what you do is you forgive and you release from them having to do something to you to garner your forgiveness. That's what you do. It's not forgive and forget, it's forgive and release. A number of years ago, uh, my wife and I went to a retreat and saw Dr. Archibald Hart, a Christian um, psychologist who um, talked about, uh, um, like, I never understood why I was wiped out. For two years, I never understood why I was so exhausted on Mondays, and he explained the phenomenon. It was great. But Dr. Archibald Hart said this, forgiveness is surrendering my right to hurt you in response to you hurting me. It's giving up my right to hurt you in response to you hurting me. I think that's very, very helpful. So if you don't understand this, you're not going to see the power of forgiveness. You're not going to see the beauty of forgiveness. And you'll put it off for someday. And we're trying to fight against that. You shouldn't put it off for someday. That's what forgiveness is. The second key question is why don't we forgive? Why is forgiveness not automatic from us? I think God knows that forgiveness is not always natural. It rarely is. The most natural thing is what? How am I to get back? How am I going to make them look bad? I mean, that's a natural thing because of our depravity. And when we're hurt, it's natural to feel like you want to respond in kind. So Jesus tells the other side. He talks about how unforgiveness works as he continues in the parable. Now notice the parallels between the first servant and the king and the second servant and the first servant. There's parallels, and it's, it's done to, to paint what's called a contrastive parallelism or what's called a foil. If you're a storyteller, you know what that means, a foil, a contrast. And look at how he does it in the parable, verses 28 to 31. But when that servant, this is the first, we'll call him the first servant, the just forgiven guy. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, let's call him the second servant or another guy, who owed him a hundred denarii. That's just a few dollars. Okay, how many was the first guy forgiven? Millions. How about him? A few bucks. He, the first servant, grabbed and choked the second servant. Pay back what you owe me. Similar language, but the physicality of it was not what the king demonstrated, right? His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. Does that sound familiar? Same language as the first guy to the king. He should have known. Oh, boy, yeah, okay. But he didn't. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master, the king, the guy who forgave the first servant, everything that had happened. We're going to pick up um, that at the very end here. But notice a few things. Number one, the first servant could have rightfully imprisoned the second servant, right? Again, nothing in the story suggests otherwise. Second, he was rightfully due the money. Nothing suggests this was wrong. But third, and here's where the story diverges from the first. He was not moved by pity, was he? Like the king. He was moved by what? Rage, anger, and bitterness. You know, a lot of people, when it comes to forgiveness, they're moved a lot more by rage, anger, and bitterness than they are by pity. And there are many reasons why people don't forgive. Can I tell you three reasons why people don't forgive that uh, maybe need some attention in your life? Here's the first. The first reason is this. We think we have to deny our feelings to forgive. 
I can't be ha- angry or hurt by anyone. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't be angry at that. And, and that's simply not true. You can and you should be angry about being wronged. But you should do so in a way that you don't hate the person who wronged you. It's an absolute myth to think you have to deny your feelings. Feelings are a God-given emotion. God gave you the emotion of feeling. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll be up here and I'll cry and I'll get emotional and I'll, I'll say, I, I apologize. And I'm probably apologizing for being a distraction, but I really shouldn't apologize for crying because God created tear ducts to cry. I mean, we, we should be emotional. Obviously, you could be, um, what kids used to, I don't know if they say it, they say emo, you know, you know what emo is? Like, everything's like, <laughs> everything's like, you know, you're at the rails. Okay. Well, they used to say that. That's what I said. They used to say that. But feelings are how you feel. You, how do you fight your feelings? I mean, Ephesians 4 says, be angry. Did you know that? Did you know that Ephesians doesn't suggest you can? The, Ephesians commands you to be angry. Some of you are like, yeah, I fulfill that one every day. Yeah, I, I've got that one fulfilled. But the rest of the verse says, be angry, command, be angry, but do not sin. Don't, 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 don't be angry in a way that's sinful. Be angry in a way that's righteous. When Jesus, twice in his ministry, the beginning and end of his earthly ministry, turned over tables, you're trying to tell me Jesus was wrong for being angry? Don't go there. Second, we think we have to ignore the offense. Sometimes we don't go, like, I just have to pretend it didn't happen. And then you rightfully say to yourself, if I ignore it, I approve of them. That's true. If you ignore it, you probably do. Again, ignoring makes it worse. Ignoring is denial. And I have found denial is more than a river that runs through Egypt. It, it's just... You have to live in Chicago or Gates to get that one. It's <laughs> God wants us to face life and face people. I, for me, I, listen, this is just me. So because of my position as a pastor, it's not because I'm any better or any worse or anything. I'm just, I'm just like you. I cut and bleed just like you. I'm a Christian trying to struggle through it. But I can't stand being around people that, that do something wrong to you and then they're fake. Like, I can't stand that. I can't stand when there's a canary under the rug and then they pretend the canary isn't there. They just walk around the canary. You know what I mean? They pretend nothing happened. and I can't stand that. Now, I'm obligated to forgive the individual. But sometimes I'm around these people and they just try to talk with me like we're buds. And then they did something. And they never really said anything about it. Now, here, it's a tough balance to untangle the yarn. But I want to forgive them. But I, me, this is just me. I can't be fake. So I'll have somebody shake my hand. Oh, you know, I miss you so much. And they, they get emotional, and they want me to get emotional. And, I mean, this happened a number of months ago, and, like, I, I didn't get emotional. You know, and, and I could tell, like, they were like, oh, I thought you, I got emotional. I thought you, and I just said, hey, look, look, I appreciate that. But, man, what you did was not cool, not cool. And um, I felt good about it. You, you I mean. <laughs> didn't feel good about getting jammed. Don't laugh at me like that. You need to understand. I felt good about it in this sense because I'm just sitting here being awesome, right? And then this individual had, had just been on a crusade, and, and it's like, oh, I'm not going to ignore my feelings. I mean, that's, that, that's uh, you know, how do you don't ignore the offense you have to deal with it. And I know I helped the individual. He probably didn't feel that way at that moment, but I did. We're hurt by people, and that's life. And you can't ignore the wounds. In fact, this is interesting. Look, up, look at Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ rose, remember he had the experience with Thomas? Did he still have the scars on his hand wrist? Did he have them on his feet? Did he have them on his side? Why? I'll take a few reasons, theologically. I think he had it to show I rose in the very same body which I was crucified, not some mystical new fake body. 
Number two, to bear testimony that, to, that in fact he did rise. But here's another one. To always let us remember what he went through. Didn't forget. How come, how come it's not cleared up? Because wounds are real. Here's a third. We think we end up losing out when we forgive. If I forgive them, I lose and they win. That's wrong. If you don't forgive, they win and you lose. If you don't forgive, they win and you lose. If you don't forgive, guess what happens? You get all upset. You're wound up. Don't talk about that. See how good I am at that? But what do they do? They're just hanging out, just being, being chill. Nothing bothers them. You're locked up. They're not. That's the right solution? No. You know, many of us struggle with unhappiness. And maybe some of you are struggling with some level of unhappiness. Maybe at some level. And there could be a lot of reasons. Can I suggest one that I've found far too common? Some people aren't happy because they refuse to forgive somebody they know they should, which is everybody. 70 times 7. And they won't forgive. They bought into one of these myths or something else and they won't forgive. In the very prison you think you're going to build around the person who hurt you, you, those bars come right around. You just imprison yourself. You do. So you, you can be prideful and say, I'm not going to forgive him. Cool. Then you're going to be bitter. Then you're in prison. You just put the bars right around yourself. I know people who are depressed because of unforgiveness. Depressed. Clinically depressed. Not because they were born that way, clinically depressed, because they won't forgive. Because, you know, depression is anger turned inward. Because there's only so much you can stuff inside, right? You can stuff it, and then you can squeeze it in here. But after a while, when you stuff it, one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to come out, and you're going to go nuts and postal, Or you're not going to let it come out and you're just going to get depressed because you have no room to feel it. That's why you ever notice a lot of people, they just don't have any room to feel emotion. Of course they don't. They're filled up with stuff. There's no room to feel happiness or sad. They're just there. I don't know about you, but I'm not necessarily a big baseball fan. Just I'm a big sports fan. But I love the World Series this year. Wasn't that great? I, I was kind of pulling for Houston just because of the the Houston strong and the poor people of Houston, like, like when the Saints won the Super Bowl post-Katrina in New Orleans. I was so happy for Houston, having some of the Dominican players there, that double win helped build some happiness in Puerto Rico. But a number of years ago, um, there was an incident which um, a few years later, four years later, on a Sunday after, Saturday afternoon in May, there was a little boy named Michael Hirschbeck. He was 13 years, old, 13 years old at the time. He put on his Cleveland Indians bat boy uniform and went looking for his friend. His friend was uh, baseball player Roberto Alomar, who um, was a second baseman for the Indians. Now, when he found him, he gave Roberto a big hug. And for Michael Hirschbeck to give Roberto a big hug was significant. Because four years earlier, Michael's dad, John Hirschbeck, got into an argument with Roberto Alomar. If you know baseball, if you remember this, this was big, big news. You know, when the batter debates something, he starts arguing with the ref, and he'll turn his hat around and do different things. Well, Roberto Alomar did the most unthinkable. He got such a fit at John Hirschbeck, he spit right in his face. Now, I don't know how that, how that works for women. Probably women don't do that. <laughs> man, but when a man does that to another man, that's, that, that's it's, it's like the lowest. I mean can't think of anything much worse. And that ugly moment had been put behind him, and now Roberto and John were working together to raise money for ALD, which is a rare uh, genetic brain disease that took the life of John Hirschbeck's eight-year-old son in 1993. Of course, Roberto Alomar 
didn't know that. But he said this, maybe God put us in this world to help somebody beat this disease. You see that? You can actually overcome and forgive, and it actually can lead to something even better. God wants this to be how unforgiveness stories end up, but how do you do it? How do you truly forgive? Now, here's where I want to just put a pause on the parable. We're going to pick up the end of it in my last question. But the third question is, how do we truly forgive? And here I want to put a pause, jump to Romans 12, and give you four practical steps. Here's the first. If you want to truly forgive people, number one, resist the temptation to get evil. Get, get even. Well, same thing, right? <laughs> Never pay back evil for evil to anyone, verse 17 to 18 says. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do your part to live in peace, watch this, as much as possible. Another translation says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with people. See, it always makes it worse to get even. You always look bad to others. Did you notice what happened when the second servant was unforgiven by the first servant? What happened? All of the other servants, what? They saw it. And the thing is, it makes you look petty. It makes you look puny. It makes you look small when you unforgive, and everybody sees it. So resist the temptation to get evil, even. Yes. <laughs> that. Do your part, and remember, you can only do your part. I'm not going to base my happiness on if you accept my forgiveness or, or if you change. I'm telling you, that's a, that's a formula for frustration when you say, my life is contingent on what you do. Well, my life is contingent on what I do, period, and what the Lord does in me. Nobody else. Two, release the situation to God. Look at verse 19. Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. He can handle it. He'll do it better. For it is written, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. It's an Old Testament quotation. Here's the truth. The truth is you have to do something with the hurt. You can't pretend it didn't hurt. I already said you shouldn't do that. You got to do something with the hurt. You can't pretend it's not there. That's, that's fallacy. It's fantasy land. You can't pretend it didn't hurt. Oh, it didn't bother me. Yeah, come on. It did. So what do you do? You do something constructive. Instead of releasing it in a destructive way, releasing it in a hurtful way, you release it to God. You give it to God. You know why? Because God understands. And God knows. He's dealt with us for 34 years. And God feels what you feel. He feels it. And God loves you. And he wants his love to have a chance to operate in a tough situation. You bring it to God. The number one way you bring it to God is through prayer. Because prayer is simply conversation with God. And when you pray for your offender, you're on the road to recovery. And here's the great thing about prayer. I understand you pray on your knees, you pray with your eyes closed, pray with your hand folded, you pray, pray in your private room. And, and, and I believe in all that and all those things, all those metaphors, all those behaviors are symbolic of humility and submitting to God. And that's all great. But here's the great thing. You can pray. You don't have to be sitting or kneeling. You can pray walking with your eyes open in between one meeting to another meeting at work. You can pray. Because pray, at all it is is just communication with God. And you can be in a meeting, a boring meeting. And that's a great time to pray, by the way. <laughs> you don't have any here at Lakeshore, but I hear at other places of employment, they have boring meetings. You can do it then, too. And here's the thing. God's always available. So release it and just say, and here's what I've learned. You keep releasing it to God because forgiveness is not just an event, it's also a process. You don't ring a bell. And when you ring the bell, it doesn't go ding. It goes ding. <laughs> because forgiveness is an event, but it's also a process. How many know that I've, I've had to forgive people 78.9 times before I finally, I finally believe myself? Here's the third. Respond to the offender with dignity. Verse 20. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. What? 
In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. I know, that's our favorite part. I don't think God's saying be phony or fake. I think God's saying meet their needs. This is called dignity. It's called giving up pot shots, gossip, and hatred. And notice the results. They get burned. They get convicted. They see the wrong for what it is. And isn't that what our goal is? For their own sake and for our own sake? They're puzzled. Why would you love me when I hurt you? Now, can I give you another alternative tape? In other words, the burning coals is they get so mad because you're happy. In other words, the opposite of I'm mad and you're happy. But another alternate interpretation is that in Egypt, there was a practice that when somebody was sorry for what they did, they would walk around with a kettle of hot charcoal on their head. Now, I'm presuming that there was an insulation layer there between, so I'm hoping so, or they'd have, especially some of y'all, it would, it would be, you know, your bald head, you'd, that would hurt. <laughs> But they must have had something. So in other words, what it is is, you, so either way, it's the same thing. In other words, you, you, you handle it so well that they are sorry for it. And isn't that the goal? To help them too? And then third, remember the consequences involved. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now here's the, here's the point. You get to choose. You can choose to forgive or not forgive. You get to choose what you're going to do, but you don't get to choose the consequences, I promise you. You can forgive and overcome it. Here, you know what the consequences of that are? Freedom. Freedom. You can refuse to forgive and be overcome. You know what the consequence of that is? Slavery. It's all up to you. Do you need to forgive somebody today? Do you struggle with feelings of bitterness? Do you think it's too hard to do it? Corey Ten Boom and her family secretly housed Jews in her home in Holland. When it was discovered, she was brought to the infamous uh, German death camp called Ravensbrück. There, Corey Ten Boom, though she survived, saw many people die, including her sister who was with her in Ravensbrück, saw her sister die. After the war, she, she returned to Germany to, de, to declare the good news. Corrie Ten Boom was a Christian, and she preached the, the good news. And in her message, she says, If we confess our sins, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And even though I cannot find a scripture for it, I believe God then places a sign out there that says, No fishing allowed. The solemn faces stared back at me, she said, not quite daring to believe. She said, Then I saw him. I saw him. His eyes and face were unmistakable. It was a guard at Ravensbrook. A guard who was responsible for the death of her sister. The man comes up to her after the talk. A fine message for all line. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. He didn't know she knew him. But she knew who he was. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. He didn't remember me. But since that time, he says, since that time, listen to this, I became a Christian. Wow. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. How would you feel to be Corey Ten Boom? He puts out his hand. Will you forgive me? And I read the rest of this quotation from her book, Tramp for the Lord. I stood there. I whose sins had again and again needed to be forgiven, and I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place, her sister. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could have been many uh, many slow, terrible deaths. It could have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do in my life. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives is a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If we do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus said, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I still stood there with a coldness clutching my heart. I love this, but forgiveness is not an emotion. What is it? By the way, it's a parenthetical comment. It's a decision. 
I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much, but you supply the feeling, Lord. And so woodenly and mechanically, I thrust out my hand into the one stretched out to me. And I love this. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then his healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. Isn't that powerful? Wow. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all of my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even then, I realized it was not my love. I had tried and did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's where I want to end as we wrap up. Where do I find the forgiveness? There's only one place, friends. I'm sorry. It's only through Jesus Christ. Because to extend forgiveness, you must experience it. Look at the end of the story, verse 32 to 35. Then the king called the man he had forgiven, in other words, the first servant, and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt, millions, because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Extend forgiveness. Then the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid every penny. See, when you don't forgive, guess what? Guess who goes to prison? You. And that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters. Don't forget those last three words. In your heart. By the way, forgive and forget? King didn't forget. So let's all bow our heads. And I want to ask you, if you're a Christian, are you struggling with forgiving somebody? Is there a face or a circumstance or something that kept popping in your head? I got a couple questions for you if you are a Christian. Do you remember how much God forgave you in Christ? You've experienced it. So don't be like the first servant. Forgive. And then by the grace of God, not only forgive, but forgive from the heart. If you're not yet a Christian, I know why you're struggling with unforgiveness. You've never experienced it. And I invite you to experience it from the greatest forgiver ever, Jesus Christ. You say, Jesus Christ, I know that you're God. Jesus Christ, I know that I sin. Jesus Christ, when you bled and died on the cross and rose again, you made a way for me by faith to go to heaven. So I put my complete faith in everything you did and no faith whatsoever in anything I could do to contribute to that. Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life. Be the director of my life. Take charge of everything. And an overwhelming sense of forgiveness will come over your life. Whether you feel it or not, it doesn't matter. And then you'll be able to forgive others. And then you'll understand what William Ward said. We're most like beasts when we kill. We're most like men when we judge. And we're most like God when we forgive. Father, do a great work in all of us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.